With Fukushima going down, the Columbia Generating Station is the same type of reactor that melted down at Fukushima and has some of the same vulnerabilities. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping we can, uh, we can work together and, and get it closed in the next few years. The utilities in Washington State that own it are all publicly owned, so the voters can decide whether or not their representatives continue to operate that plant. And uh, to the extent that we in Oregon can encourage them to shut it down to preserve our region, uh, we, we should do that. And perhaps that should be something that's stated in the Nuclear Free Zone Ordinance. Just want to give you a little background on nuclear free zones. Um, according to the last count that I have access to, there are 15 nuclear free uh, Native American nations within the area bounded by the United States and 202 locally declared U.S. nuclear free zones in 33 states covering 21 million Americans. Now these are a variety of, some of these are purely symbolic. There were resolutions that were passed. Even some of the ordinances really don't have any teeth to them. In fact, Portland ha is listed as having a, a nuclear free zone. We are? Yes. Uh, passed by resolution, city council resolution, in um, 1985. 85. Yep. So. Uh, they reframed it then. Well, because it was a resolution, they probably didn't save it. It's not in the laws. You'd have to go back to 85 and find the resolution to find the exact wording of it. So, I have a model nuclear free zone resolution. I used to work for a group called Nuclear Free America and we encouraged people all across the United States to declare themselves nuclear free zones and working closely with Grace Thorpe from the uh, National Environmental Coalition of Native Americans uh, we, we assisted in uh, passing these uh, nuclear free zones in, on Native American lands as well. Um, some of them were based on the issue of nuclear weapons. In fact, all of the initial ones were. They were passed during the, the nuclear freeze era in the 1980s. Uh, some of them, the later ones, were based on uh, at, uh, nuclear waste. There are a number of different plans for storing radioactive waste uh, on Native American lands or through what they call interstate compacts where states agree to take everybody, else, uh, everybody else's so-called low-level waste and store it in their state. And we were helping communities in Ohio, Connecticut, and a number of other places, California, that were fighting off these low-level waste dumps, as well as some of the Native American nations where their tribal leadership misguidedly was deciding to try and take all of the money to store uh, high-level radioactive waste. Fortunately, uh, uh, the people in those, in those, uh, uh, on those Native American uh, nations decided against going for it. So, um, but the model nuclear free zone ordinance that I have here, basically, I'm going to get very wonky here, so you got to forgive me. Um, there are specific things that if you decide to do a nuclear free zone here, you're going to need to decide on. Um, and one of the main ones is going to be if you're going to exclude anything. The basic exclusions that are in the model uh, ordinance um, include basic research and or any writing or speech devoted to public commentary or debate. And that's in there basically because there is research that involves using radionuclides. There's a lot of medical uh, uh, techniques that use uh, radioactive materials. Some of these are, are beneficial. Some might argue they're not, but, uh, but they're part of uh, a regular part of medicine that we currently use in the United States. So those, that's usually exempted. And again, uh, the research application or temporary storage of radioactive materials used in medicine is exempted frequently. Consumer uses of radioactive materials for smoke detectors, light emitting watches or clocks, and other similar incidental applications. That's an exemption that's a practical exemption. It's not a great exemption. Fact of the matter is, in everybody's house, you probably have a little bit of americium which is a byproduct of the nuclear weapons uh, production that has taken place in this country. It's, uh, it's what powers your smoke detector. It's what, it's, it's what uh, 
causes the, uh, it, it's, it's part of the alarm system for your smoke detector. So smoke detectors are hazardous waste and should be taken to uh, the hazardous waste uh, treatment uh, storage place, uh, places that we have in, uh, that Metro has set up as opposed to just being thrown in the dump because that's it, it has americium in there. But again, it's everywhere. Banning americium laced smoke detectors in the city of Portland is probably not practical. Uh, finally, industrial radiography and tracer processes. There's a lot of uh, use of source radiation to, to look underground and see where pipes are located and things like that. So that, that kind of thing, we've decided we would exempt. We don't want to like be impractical. It's being used for that purpose. Um, so, to the basic things that it, that it can prohibit, you can decide whether you want to include these things. The storage, use, or disposal of radioactive materials. That seems fairly evident. Uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons work. Yes. Sometimes... Oh, yeah. What about the tritium exit signs? Tritium exit signs uh, also... In Try to get those abolished, or at least we could. properly. Yeah, that could be that, that again. You can get. You have to get it. If, if you're going to do an ordinance, you're going to have to get in the weeds. Uh, so you might have to decide things like exit signs have a little bit of tritium on them frequently. Whether or not you want to try and ban that or not. Um, the prohibition of nuclear weapons work is usually very controversial. It was extremely controversial here in Portland the two times that they attempted nuclear free zones. Um, there was a second time after this 85 ordinance or uh, 85 resolution passed. I thought they had passed a symbolic uh, nuclear free zone ordinance. Possibly they didn't. But anyway, the main issue that caused problems for that was uh, we have uh, the um, Precision cast parts. And Solzer. And what? Solzer. Solzer. I didn't know about Solzer. They make pumps they make for nuclear plants and oil rigs. Okay. So, but that, and that, that would be nuclear power plants, so that would be commercial nuclear power, but still, it's the same principle. You have industries that are, uh, with precision cast parts, they're making parts for Boeing aircraft and, uh, and also for uh, cruise missiles, some of which are nuclear capable and uh, therefore would, be, would have been categorized as a, a nuclear weapons system. How do you deal with Reed College? Reed College is a reactor. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so uh, the city council, I know in 90 they were trying to pass one with teeth that, that wouldn't have allowed any nuclear weapons work and they failed because uh, the city council was afraid uh, to be anti-business and uh, limit activities of uh, precision cast parts specifically. So that's that's something you'll have to deal with. Uh, prohibition of nuclear reactors. We uh, do have a nuclear reactor in Portland, a, a very small one, but it, nonetheless it is a nuclear uh, reactor at Reed College. It's an experimental reactor and it's one that uh, they use for their uh, instruction purposes. <coughs> and. Uh, it's been considered sacrosanct in the past, but it wouldn't hurt to take it on, actually, in my opinion. Um, and finally, there's the issue of transportation of radioactive materials. <coughs> that is, goes into the area of symbolic, because even if you pass it, it will be ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Uh, court system. That's really well established. That hasn't stopped some communities from passing nuclear free zone ordinances that had bans on transportation. Simply for the symbolic value and to the extent you could get your law enforcement to attempt to enforce it, you could create a lot of publicity. Uh, at one point, Idaho was getting a lot of waste transported into there, and they still do get, get some, but there, there, was, there were large shipments that were scheduled to go to Idaho and the governor of Idaho, Cecil Andrews, said that he was going to have state troopers arrest anybody who tried to bring the waste in. I'm not su suggesting that we have anyone who's that strong on this issue currently in Oregon, but that is probably about the only way that you could do this, is if a state or local entity is willing to break federal law 
or threaten to break federal, federal law and th thus influence federal policy in that way. Finally, there's the fact that there's, there's signage. A lot of nuclear-free zones at one time had signs at, at the entrances of all of their, uh, of, of the main entrances of town where the, the uh, town uh, signs <coughs> the town's name and population are listed. They'd have a nuclear free zone sign. And that's something you can consider doing. And then enforcement, the model legislation says each day is a, uh, it's a $1,000 fine to, to violate this and each day of, uh, that you're in violation is considered a separate fine. You could maybe up that if you wanted to. So that's basically it. Uh, you know, it's a lot of work to do a nuclear free zones. I think if, if you're going to do it and, and make it have teeth, you need to think about what it is that you want to influence, whether it's something in the region or some national or international policy, and really focus on that and use it. It is a symbolic gesture uh, because Portland isn't going to stop the nuclear arms race or nuclear power, but we contribute to it every day.